and welcome to the Tumble Mount podcast. Joining me once again is my good friend Hermes, and today we have a very interesting conversation, uh, which is war. War in the past and the present, tactics and meaning of war, and all those things. Before we get into it, make sure you join the Temple Mount Discord server, and make sure you follow and subscribe to the Temple Mount podcast on YouTube and SoundCloud, and you can find those links at the top of the Temple Mount Discord server. That being said, welcome Hermes, thanks for joining us, and please feel free to take us through uh, this interesting topic. Awesome. So, I will be talking about the philosophy of, philosophy of war, which is simple. Um, and then I'll be talking about why war exists and that why it's inevitable. I will be talking about some tactics of war. Obviously, I can't go over all of it. And I will be talking about different levels of war and hopefully how to win those wars. So to begin, um, the philosophy of war really in, in its simplicity is just one of seeking victory. And then the next question arises, what defines a victory? Well, a victory is defined by the similarity between the goals of the war and the reality we live in. So if your goals were to reach a specific outcome and the reality matches that outcome, that constitutes a victory. And I'm going to read a quote from a cartoon uh, that I really like um, by the character Aaron Yeager. It makes a lot of sense, and I like it. So what he says is this. If you lose, you die. If you don't fight, you can't win. So you sure as shit gotta fight. Life is a fight. It's a struggle from beginning to end. And um, to add on, in other words, wars are a result of a reality that is in conflict with our goals and dreams. Anyone with a dream is in, in, a, is in a war with reality to some degree. The goal is to change slash destroy this current reality to replace it with one of your dreams. So what is war? War is a state of conflict. It is a state of two things being different. And it is you that attempts to change that difference or minimize that difference such that it reaches how you desire the world to be. And to, you know, emphasize on why this is so important is that we live in one reality, a singular reality. And the universe is on the side of the powerful, always. For power really is the currency of the universe. Power is what bends the universe to your will. And whatever goals you have, power is the means to attain it. Therefore, through proxy, power is the ultimate goal. And, you know, the idea that we all share this reality and that power bends that reality, this gives it an objective quality because power is objective. It's not subjective. If you change the reality that we all share, then indeed you have created an objective change in the nature of the universe or in the structure of the universe, to be more precise. But there are a couple of really interesting things about war and power. So in order to be powerful, you need to go through many steps. For example, we can look at different animals and different predators and see how they perform. Lions commonly have been considered the king of the jungle or whatever, but in actuality, a lion can never really turn a city to dust. We can. And there are reasons for that. It's because we have gone through certain steps. There is a selective bias in the universe by which it allows certain groups re to reach a state of power, whereas others don't. And um, before, in one of my previous podcasts, I argued that through the path of power, you can find the path of morality, so to speak. And I explain this in the sense that from an evolutionary perspective, that which increases your power would make sense to be associated with goodness. So cooperation is one of the learning, educate, edu education, building on previous knowledge, and so on and so forth. The nuclear bomb would have never happened if we did not have a society that was civilized enough and had the infrastructure to then allow smart people to actualize their potential 
and understand the nature of the world as it is, and then to use that to their advantage. So a path that allows knowledge to increase to a state that we can understand more about the universe, that in turn allows us to use that knowledge to basically shape the universe to our will. And another fact about the universe is that it's ever-changing. It's in many ways hostile, and we can look at the number of extinct species to kind of verify that. And in many ways, the universe is indifferent to us. The only thing the universe understands, the only language it understands is power. And this is why power is so important. And of course, uh, and I know I'm repeating myself, things like empathy and, you know, all like investing in people and bringing out the maximum potential of individuals, that is a path of power. And it is essential to have that power, no matter what your goal is. So the next state, or sorry, the next part of this is why does war exist? Well, as I said, there is usually a conflict between internal desires and dreams and external reality. And understanding the nature of rational self-interest and understanding the nature of the external world, the goal is to figure out how to successfully maximize your chances of achieving your goals while taking into consideration the nature or properties of the external world. In other words, to realize that there are other entities or groups with differing goals, then there is, in essence, a state of war. And even if there weren't other groups, the war would always still be there, so long as there's dreams, so long as there's unknowns, and so long as the universe is ever-changing, even if the war is simply to preserve. And there are many tactics of war that I can get into, uh, ideally, and this is the most efficient tactic when it comes to different entities with different goals, is to convert, persuade, and reason with. Also, this is a form of soft power. It is one where people voluntarily want to associate with you because your path is more reasonable and in line with their actual true goal, which may be continuity and living a prosperous life. So conversion really, in essence, is the number one path to winning a war with another entity that can reason. And another one that I would consider to be far less efficient is assimilation by force. This can, of course, include, you know, um, laws or chips, actually, you know, chips, like brain control chips, eh, chips, sorry and other forms of like technological use to kind of align people towards a goal. Now, I don't like this as much. I think it is inefficient, but it is more efficient than the other ones that I will talk to talk about. Another one is to subvert through pop propaganda and human puppets or, you know, political pundits. Basically, Subversion is a highly effective way of persuading people, but it has a lot of risks. So it's not persuading people with honesty, and even if there is a voluntary association, it is done through lies. And the issue with lies is that it takes more lies to sustain that lie, and if that ever comes out, you kind of lose most of your credibility. And there is almost, in essence, a disproportionate amount of energy that would be used in sustaining the lie and the propaganda. And also, this would also necessitate a form of censorship. It would necessitate a form of information control and some sort of a dystopian reality where certain aspects of knowledge and intellect uh, would be blocked or restricted by the state or any other uh, controlling entity. And another one that I would say that falls even below that, and it's far less efficient, far less uh, effective, is to subjugate, dominate, or occupy. This is basically when the military, you know, occupies a nation. Obviously, the internal conflict that the people have remains. And because the internal conflict remains, because this subjugation isn't really aligning their interest, this is in many ways a form of stalemate, one that if 
the balance of power shifted, they would immediately strike back and kill you. It's not very effective. And then one that's but but the, the one of the benefits of this is that when you do subjugate a group, you can get to use them for your interests. So like if you subjugate, let's say Afghanistan, then you can use its resources for your benefits. You can increase the opium trade or whatever, and such. You can utilize the group to empower yourself, which is you know better than completely destroying them. Which is the next one I was going to talk about. Dest- Destruction or destruction is the next stage. And what is destruction really? Destruction is basically causing dysfunction, causing enough dysfunction to a system or organization or entity such that it stops functioning permanently. There are many ways of doing this, of course. You can do this through misinformation, you can do this through economic sanctions, you can do this through political pressure and isolating certain groups, you can do this through weapons of war, simply bombing the shit out of your enemies and killing them. You can do this through attrition, a war of attrition is very effective, especially in the past, even now still it's effective. You can also do it through a form of psychological warfare by turning people against each other and um, Uh, I I didn't write the last part, but there was another aspect to it as well. And if this fails, right, if you can't destroy, and I have to emphasize, destruction is the path you take if you're too desperate and too weak to take in the previous options. Ideally, as I said, conversion is the, the goal, because that way you wouldn't be wasting the potential of the group. Um, but even if you can't destroy, the next stage is basically a strategic retreat with the goal of recuperating and so that you can find another day, you know. And, and a weird example of this is tolerance. And I know there's the paradox of tolerance. And I want to kind of redefine tolerance in a way that makes more sense. Tolerance really is a form of self-restraint when you realize that you are in either the wrong or because you realize the consequences of being open would be far too negative and as such, bottling up your whatever perspective it is, is more beneficial for your continuity and survival. And in essence, it can provide an opportunity to re, uh, reassociate yourself with society. So tolerance is never for someone that's in the right, so to speak, or in a position of advantage. You should never tolerate evil. That doesn't make any sense. Tolerating is just a form of self-restraint, mostly when you're wrong or mostly when the consequences of coming out is horrible. And another thing that you can do if you can't have a strategic retreat with the goal of recuperating and then finding another day is simply to avoid as much as you can with no chance of winning. This is basically a kind of loss, really, because continuously you're giving space, land, and power to the expanding entity that you're fighting against. And the last one, really, is to capitulate, completely submit and give up on all your values and everything and become part of the entity that you're in war with. That is losing. That's absolutely losing. Um, And it's the worst kind of losing. So what really defines an enemy, really? That, That is a really key issue. What really is an enemy? How do you differentiate between an ally and an enemy? What is an in-group and what is an out-group? And what differentiates between an in-group and an out-group is one very simple thing, a conflict of interest. Whenever there is a conflict of interest, what happens is that there is a clash. And a clash leads to an outcome. And that outcome is determined by the power differentials between the different entities clashing. So for example, if group A and group B clash, and they have completely different ideals and goals, and if group B is far more powerful than group A, then group B will get it more their way. Why? Because the universe does not listen to anything but power. And we are all forced to live in this universe. So, By changing reality, in essence, you're forcing the enemy to live 
in a world that is in alignment with your dreams. And to go even further than that, um, one moment, my writings are a little bit, a uh, little bit off. Just give me like 10 seconds. I think I already talked about that. All right, so let's talk about causing dysfunction in, when you've reached a goal of destruction. So when you, when you want to cause dysfunction, really, it is to look at a system, analyze a system, analyze a nation or an entity or anything, and trying to find its vital parts, the parts that provided the most amount of functionality, the key parts, the necessary parts. And this is what we do when we kill people. We aim at vital organs because that is what causes the maximum amount of dysfunction and that is what leads to a system failure and death. And the same rules apply when you're fighting another group or another nation. You go for what is most valuable for their functionality. That really is the essence of creating dysfunction. And there, there is a lot more that, that goes into this. For example, we know that having correct information allows you to make more informed decisions with a higher chance of succeeding. So if you're dealing with an enemy, your goal is to provide as much false information as possible and to withhold any information that you cannot uh, provide false information instead of. So ideally, you give as much disinformation to your enemy such that they waste their time and energy. But that's not all. By providing false information to your enemy, in essence, because you know they're acting on that false information, there are two great advantages you get from this. One, you can predict their action because you know the information they're acting upon and being able to predict your enemy is a great advantage in war. But also, the energy and time that they have spent on that false information means that they could have spent that energy in a more productive way against you, but they did not. So it's a very, very, very information to play the information warfare game in a, in a state of war. And um, also realizing that there's a limited amount of time and energy, you know, it, it further vindicates what I just said. There, there are, of course, many different levels of war, and war is always present. Life, in a sense, you can say, is a form of war, a war for continuity, a war against death. War is the very nature of this world, and peace is a lie. There is no such thing as peace, even if the entirety of the universe, sorry, the entirety of Earth united under one common cause, trying to build a better world and to conquer stars. At the end of the day, we would be in war with an ever-changing hostile universe, and we would be at war with our own ignorance, because there's always unknown unknowns, and there are even known unknowns. In essence, that is a form of war, because you're trying to change something using your force, using your power to maximize your own power, to then create this positive feedback cycle, which is really, I would say, the story of this world. It is a story where we have one thing, one reality, and we have one currency, one true global currency, and that is power. Um, of course, there are you know conventional wars where we have ground warfare, naval warfare, air warfare, space warfare, cyber warfare, psychological warfare, which in it also includes information warfare, which is also part of cyber warfare. And then we have the ideological warfare. And to me, that is the key. Because at the end of the day, humans are a slave to their beliefs and their ideas. And if you can control their beliefs and ideas, you do not need to destroy them. You have already won. So the ideological warfare is truly the, the epitome of the highest form of battle. If you can control people's will, you've You've already uh, already won in many ways. Of course, another thing about war is that and one of the benefits of war is that in many in many senses, people can become complacent with life. They can get comfortable 
and be in this kind of comfort bubble and kind of forget the existential crisis we all face. They can even forget the nature of this world, which is an eternal war. And this can lead to stagnation and a loss of power gain. And this is very detrimental to the goals of that group. Sorry about it, I'm about to burp. All right. So one of the benefits of wars is that it reignites our survival instincts and brings us back into a state of existential awareness, you know? And this is why a lot of times we can see when it comes to war, people give it 110%. They understand stakes. Normally, in a comfortable surrounding, you don't understand that. Therefore, in many ways, war can remind us to do our best to push ourselves as far as we can and to understand that not doing so is basically giving the enemy what they want, even if the enemy is an ever-changing, hostile, and different universe. So I would suggest that if you are to live in this world, live like a soldier all the time. Realize that there is an active war and every moment matters. Every bit of your time and energy matters. And you must use it to the best of your ability to achieve your goals and desires. That is how we win, in essence. Of course, this doesn't guarantee winning, but it is more likely than not. Well, actually, even that's not the case. Um, but it gives you a greater chance. Let's put it that way. Um, and of course, another aspect that I forgot to mention um, is sociological warfare, but I, I think I kind of did when I was talking about dysfunction. But a form of sociological warfare is, you know, economic warfare, exclusionary actions towards the state, forming alliances, which then creates um, you know, trade blocks or restrictions to other nation groups. And all of these are highly effective at bringing the other entity to its knees. Um, But at the end of the day, I would say that really, if you want to truly win at at the core, the main focus is the ideological warfare. And this also means that there is war everywhere between people, between groups, between demographics in many ways as well, between and different political blocks. And of course, there is the war of economics that happened inside the nation. I'm not talking about international you know, economic warfare, but intranational economic warfare, where people can have very different interests, but the one with the more money gets it their way, and the one that has less money is more desperate and has to capitulate to the will and the desires of the more powerful because that is the nature of this reality. We cannot escape from it. So another form of warfare is through voting. Of course, there are different groups and different ideals and different goals, so to speak. And there, there is a conflict of interest. Now, fortunately, most states have a monopoly on violence, which then leads it, which sorry, which then leads to alternatives to violence when it comes to fighting this war. Of course, voting is one of it. Going around and talking about your ideology and trying to convert people to your side is part of that war, and you are partaking in a war when you're doing that. You're just not using violence, but it's still warfare. And you can think of it this way. The losing side in a democratic society is subjugated to the winning side. They still have to pay taxes. They still have to work and live in that group. But they will be paying taxes to create a world that is in contrast with their interest. Normally, this would lead to a violent uh, revolution of some kind. Fortunately, because there is a rematch every couple of years, this kind of gives an outlet or an alternative to violence. And 
Um, I, I think I, I covered a lot of it, but is there any questions? Because, you know, I just want to answer some questions if possible. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, very good. Um, probably a few questions. But one would be, you know, you mentioned that, like, we'll always be at war because we would be at war with nature or we would be at war with death itself or a changing universe. And I agree. But my question is, is that literally true or is that just not just but or is that a metaphor? Right. Is it not actually part of the nature of war that it has to be against other conscious sentient beings in some sense, right? Or, or would you say we're actually at war with, say, disease or COVID? Or is that a metaphorical war? I would, I would say that sentience does not really get to define the nature of war. Of course, sentience adds multiple layers and multiple layers of complexity, to be more precise. But no, I would say that it is, in fact, a war. There is a war against death, a war against, quote-unquote, drugs. Of course, I disagree with that war, but it's, the war is still there. And you are taking actions to change things, and changing, in many ways, can be considered destruction. It's a destruction of the previous form. It is in essence, aligning the universe to your will by subjugating it through power, the only language the universe truly understands. Sir. So, you know, you mentioned something about you should live, I can't remember what you said, but something along the lines of you should live like a soldier, like you should live as though you're always at war. And that's, you know, what Musashi said, is that live every day as though you're on the battlefield and you, you will become strong. So, I mean, would you agree that we should basically orient ourselves then to be a warrior society and that we should actually organize our entire society to be martial in nature? If, in fact, we're in an eternal war we can't escape from, shouldn't we really design our whole society from top to bottom as, like, a war society? In a sense, but there should be you know, clarifications on the different types of war. A lot of the times people conflate war with just the conventional bombs and missiles war. Obviously that is a part of it, but there are many different ways of war. For example, you can think of scientists as warriors that are fighting against the unknown and converting the unknown to the known and fighting their own ignorance or the ignorance of the world, in a sense. So there are multiple, multiple ways to fight against this, this ever-changing world. One where we are mortal. One where it really takes effort to sustain ourselves in this world. There is the daily maintenance that we have to do from brushing our teeth, taking a shower, eating, taking care of ourselves, exercising. There is no rest. There will never be rest. There is no such thing as actual peace. So yes, I think a warrior mentality is the way to go, but not in the, I'm going to beat your ass up, more like you continuously have to fight for what you believe in and never stop, never relent, and give it your all, no matter what. Well said, and I agree. Um... This is interesting. I'm just looking at Sun Tzu and Musashi quotes. These are the two guys that, you know, I like to look at for uh, understanding of war and combat. But uh, Sun Tzu has an interesting quote. It didn't come out properly in the resolution, but you can see it in general chat. It says, there is no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. Do you think that's true? And if true, why? And also, what does that say about the U.S. being involved in prolonged warfare? And is it benefiting them or not? Well, I think it depends on the kind of warfare um, and, of course, the power differential. If it's a form of equal type of warfare or you going versus the entire world, then the consequences of that would be more negative than good. In those situations, I would say a strategic retreat with the goal of self-improvement is the way to go about it. And this is one part I forgot to talk about. There are two major routes when it comes to war. One is to, as I said, convert, assimilate, subvert, subjugate, 
retreat, avoid, or capitulate. But there is another aspect of war that's just as important, and that's improvement, self-improvement. So the rules are improve your own function while creating dysfunction in the other group or in the out group. Maximize your own functionality. That is really important. So like if you're a small nation and you don't really know what the fuck is going on and you want to fight with the world, you're basically doomed to lose. However, if you are a small nation, you could instead focus on education, economic reform, and of course that can lead to weapons research and many other things. And of course you can participate in war in many different ways. Right now, the main form of warfare is economic warfare and in many ways also cultural warfare. But at the end of the day, war remains and it's always true no matter what. And to add on to that, I'll give a scenario. If we have two entities with mutually exclusive goals, literally their gain is your loss and your gain is their loss. And um, your loss is their gain and their loss is your gain. You get it, where I'm going with this. And the reason for that is simple, because we live in one universe. And if your goals are in opposition to them, and they get to win, or they get to gain power or functionality, it literally means the universe that you live in will be moving further away from your goals and dreams. And that is a, a that, that is losing. That is moving away from the state of victory, which is an alignment with your dreams or goals with reality. So as long as there is a conflict of interest, there is really no other choice but war. And I do believe that many times a conflict of interest is there, not because there really is a true conflict of interest, but because there's a misunderstanding with respect to what the real interests are. So I do believe it is possible to unify a lot of people under a common interest, such as continuity, you know, better life, blah, 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 blah. But when reason fails, we have to resort to alternatives to reason. This is why we have a police force or a military or whatever. Obviously, in an ideal world, talking would be the way to go. You know, you provide your evidence, you have a better argument, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, one way or another, we can resolve our conflicts through talking. Um, obviously, that's not the case. People can be irrational. People can double down, you know, whatever. So it is essential for any entity to have as much power as they can, including military power. It is super important for the United States, for example, to maintain its military supremacy if it is to sustain its existence. Uh, if there's any questions? And I have uh, another. Um, so again, Sun Tzu quote, all war is deception. Do you agree with that? Or is it possible for war to be straightforward and not deceptive in nature? Well, uh, I do think that is overgeneralizing. I, as I said, information warfare is critical and in many ways more important, I would argue. But I wouldn't say it's the entirety of warfare. Yes, information is incredibly important when it comes to making decisions. Because if you have the correct information, then it is more likely than not that you will get the expected result. Whereas if someone has a false information and they're acting on it, there's a very good chance that they will not get what they desire. A very simple and stupid example of this is if someone has the information that gravity, for example, doesn't exist and they jump out the window and they fall down and die, obviously the, <laughs> the, expect, uh, the expected result is different than what they expect, which was to float or some stupid shit like that. Whereas the one that is informed knows that they're going to uh, fall and therefore can plan accordingly. And I know this is a very childish example, but it still highlights the point. It is essential to have correct information. And deception, as I said, is more effective than withholding information because of the two reasons, as I said, the, time and, the limited time and energy that is used 
to you know work on that you know false information or figure it out and of course knowing that they're working on that information allows you to predict the enemy's actions so information warfare is one of the key aspects of war but not the entirety of it no anything else Um, well, I suppose since we're talking about war and as you know, uh, on this server, one of the main things we do with it, at least I do is update subjects like war and military and intelligence and counterintelligence and politics. So of course there's this, all this going on with, uh, Ukraine and Russia. So do you have any analysis of, you know, one, do you think there will be war? And then I see, you know, follow ups from that. So that that's a, that's an interesting question because it's happening right now. Initially, when I was looking at it, I was thinking that from a rational self-interest perspective, it is not in the interest of Russia to invade Ukraine. And I still stand by that. I don't think it's a rational choice. But given you know the movement of forces, and not just forces, the movement of supplies, construction equipment, blood, and the amount of money that was spent there, knowing the ideology and personality of Putin, I think it is more likely than not that they will invade unless they have something to walk back with. So if I was negotiating, one of the things I would do if I wanted to prevent the spilling of blood, specifically of Ukrainians and even Russians, would be to potentially, at the moment, at the very least, give some sort of concession, such as the NATO expansion one, perhaps, so that they would be able to walk back and say it was not all for nothing. However, if no concession is given, then I see no reason for retreat. I do think that Putin is hard-headed enough to follow through with this action, even if it means the economic sanctions will be crippling. And what worries me even more than that is that once those sanctions hit, and if they're going to hit, I believe it's going to be very hard, of course, this will in turn cause a shift in alliances between you know China, blah, blah, blah. There will be underground deals and stuff to soften the blow. But at, at the end of the day, I have seen a country, I've lived in a country that has been isolated and economically sanctioned. It doesn't turn out well. And in most cases, the pattern that arises isn't one where they change their mind and decide to then join or reverse their actions. Instead, by having crippling sanctions, you're not only antagonizing the government, but also the people, further causing further dividing the groups and causing uh, an increased level of tension but because russia is a nuclear power escalation to me seems like an incredibly stupid idea a very short-sighted idea so to me really the key goal in this case is to somehow resolve it through diplomacy ideally by giving something to putin even though i don't want it I don't like him. I do not. But I do think it is better to give him something because the consequences of not doing so is too severe to imagine. And this doesn't mean necessarily that, you know, if someone is threatening you, you must comply. But in most cases, people do. If someone points a gun at your kid or at your wife, someone you care about, um, even though they're bad and they're in the wrong it makes more sense to capitulate at that moment, at the, sorry, at that moment, at the very least, to de-escalate and hopefully find alternative routes to deal with this issue. That's my take on it. So, just uh, exercise. Let's say that tonight at midnight, um, Putin launches a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. You know paratroopers, tanks, infantry, whole nine yards, sweeps all the way to uh, this, I can't remember for some reason right now, the capital city of Ukraine, I can't remember what it's called right now, but, you know, goes to take the capital, completely take over the whole country of Ukraine. What would you do if you were, you know, Biden? How would you react to that in terms of your military response? 
I, ideally, the way I would want to deal with it would be to have very targeted sanctions, not broad sanctions that hits the people. I would want to use soft power for the people. I would definitely use secret, you know, um, spies and shit to cause discord and hatred for Putin. I would perhaps even attempt to assassinate him if possible. Um, I would do... You know, in a very secretive way, obviously, to make it look natural. Point is, um, I would want to dethrone Putin because I don't think Russia or the world really needs to go to that degree of conflict and instability. So, but I don't want it to get to that state because to me, the way I see it is that once it crosses that line, it is probably more likely than not that there will be further escalation on both sides. And for two nuclear powers to have further escalation, that's not something I'm looking forward to. So on the flip side, let's say you were, for whatever reason, employed as Putin's military advisor. Do you have to give him any tips on how to carry out his agenda? I would... I would stretch the the period um, of this, how do I put it, build up of forces, and I would do my very best to get some form of concession so that I can walk back, tell my people, hey, uh, all that money and shit that we spent, you know, all this, you know, movement that we did, we got something out of it. You know, and I would be really focusing on something like that because, and I could be wrong. I don't really see any form, any way of retreating if there's just the threat of sanctions, no matter how severe. I just think that's going to further isolate Russia, and that is not something I think would be good for the world, or, or for the Russian people, or for America, or for anyone for that matter. So. Um, I do think it would be ideal to avoid this conflict through whatever means necessary. Question. Sure. Um, so you want to avoid the conflict here with Russia. Do you feel the same way about the conflict with China and Taiwan? Yes, I, I do think it's possible to... Well, Taiwan... Um, oh, God, that's a whole fucking other can of worms. I, I, do I, I know it's expanding the scope of this, and I'm sorry to do that. But that's fine. You understand why I'm asking. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so for that one, again, I also think further escalation would be ideal. However, there is there – is, sorry, not further escalation. Further de-escalation would be ideal. Diplomatic reasonings, under-the-table deals, whatever necessary, I think would be ideal. But because of the interdependence between the United States and, and China, I – it's less likely for me to see it ever escalating to a point that I can see it happening with Russia. Russia isn't as big of a player, uh, especially when it comes to economics, whereas China is the second largest uh, economy. Uh, the U.S. is the biggest trading partner, which, of course, reduces war. And that's actually one way I would deal with um, with creating a more stabilized world is to create – a kind of more interdependent economy, which makes it, which makes the incentives for war less likely. So with with China, I think there there might be ways to kind of you know prioritize trade deals and economics over violating you know Taiwan's space, so to speak. I, I mean, it would be bad, but I cannot see it escalating to what would or could potentially happen with Russia. Another good example of this is we can look at like groups like Saudi Arabia and stuff, you know, they're human rights violators. Obviously, human rights violation isn't the goal here. It's never been the goal. The United States isn't this bastion of, you know, human rights and freedom and democracy spreading all that shit. That's not really the case. The United States, like any other nation, acts on its own rational self-interest. It understands that aligning with Saudi Arabia, even though they behead people, even though they're the largest exporters of Wahhabi terrorism and Wahhabi Islam, and even though they killed the journalist, they literally cut him into pieces in the, uh, the embassy, if I remember correctly, and all of that happened, at the end of the day, 
due to their economic importance and due to their strategic you know advantage that they give us i believe it is possible to push those under the rug whereas for russia i don't really see those similarities Um, do you believe there are any circumstances in which America will we'll keep it to America for the purpose of the conversation should not only impose economic sanctions, but should actually deploy more troops as I've already deployed troops, but deploy troops. And in other words, should they, under what conditions would it be necessary to go beyond economic sanctions to actually, you know, some kind of hot war? I, I think that's, a risky play. It might actually be beneficial to deploy a large amounts of troops to Ukraine, because that that would mean that if Russia does in fact invade, it would be mutually assured destruction, nuclear war, and blah blah blah. I don't think that is something we need to risk. I think that is something that must be avoided under any and all circumstances. Just avoid it. Period. No matter what avoid a nuclear war. So it's possible that placing U.S. forces, ground troops, and, and whatnot in Ukraine could, in many ways, greatly decrease the chances of Russia invading, but that slight chance that Putin just kind of goes forward because he's kind of doubled down on this, I don't want to risk that even small percentage chance. So to me, putting troops on the ground is too high of a risk let's put it that way what if there was you know clear evidence of like grievous um human rights abuses like what if a bunch of footage came out of you know russians just lining up ukrainians against walls and just like mowing them down or something like that yeah even at the end of the day just like with saudi arabia you know you can put your you can put your differences aside you know it's it's not like Countries aren't these moral bastions that protect freedom and democracies and blah, blah, blah. Countries are entities, entities that act in their own rational self-interest. I would argue that, you know, even if there is concentration camps where people are being tortured and killed, it might be in the best interest of the United States to not engage them directly just because Russia is a nuclear power and the consequences of that could be far more dire than the suffering of the people in the camp. It could be a global catastrophe of the worst kind. One more follow-up question on something you said. Do you believe that the existence of nuclear weapons or specifically two nations having substantial nuclear weapons stockpiles makes conventional warfare between them impossible? like without enacting mutually assured destruction because my understanding of mutually assured destruction is it's mutually assured destruction for anyone to fire a nuke at anyone else because then they'll retaliate with a nuke but in principle do you think it's possible for russia and america to engage in a full-blown war with you know tanks and airplanes and soldiers and yet neither resort to using nukes so out of an understanding that even though it's mutually, it's mutually assured destruction but we can still have a fight without going all the way so the reason why I think that's not very likely is that one side will eventually dominate the other. In this case, I would say the United States would completely demolish Russia because, I mean, I can go over the, the expenditures, military, blah, blah, blah. But Russia, since 2008, has had their military expenditure cut by like 40% or something. A lot of their equipment is outdated and blah, blah, blah. Whereas the United States spends more than the next 10 countries combined. They've got the brightest minds working, building crazy technology. I'm talking about bunker busters that use material science such that the... The, for example, the bomb doesn't break down until it goes several meters underground and then explodes underneath, killing everybody inside. Like that, the technology they have is superior in every way. And this, to me, would basically mean that if Russia turns out, like, like we can say it starts with a conventional war, but then Russia is getting desperate and they're losing. Once you get desperate and you're losing, I think it is potentially possible to fire nukes. And to me, that is too risky. Uh, yeah, so I agree that 
America is unquestionably the most powerful military in the world right now, although that gap is closing pretty quickly with both Russia and China, and Russia is number two. Um, what do you think about the fact that, you know, the Pentagon's own analysis has shown that if America were to engage in a full-scale war with China in the South China Sea, for example, if they decided to stop, try and stop them from taking Taiwan, the Pentagon's analysis says that they would lose that war. America would lose that war. So why do you think that is? Or to put it differently, do you think the same could happen with Russia, where even though you're militarily superior on paper, there's also such a thing as like a home team advantage, right? So Russia is fighting right on its front door, which means all its supply chains, like the range of its weapons, its ability to re re uh, rearm and resupply and all that is much greater because there's no distance. So is it possible that home team advantage might actually change the equation? Yeah, um... You know, geography plays plays a huge, huge role in warfare. There's also the issue of logistics, you know, moving your forces when they're really far away and the amount of forces that you can divert. You know, you can't divert your entire military. So um, is it possible? Eh, maybe. I think it's like it could be, but the idea of U.S. troops dying by China or Chinese forces, I, I don't think that would be something that anybody would really want to entertain. I think it's okay to entertain this when you're dealing with countries that don't have nukes, like Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, you know, Korea, the Korean War, or in, in Africa, there's a lot of war going on there, and drone strikes in Somalia, and blah, blah, blah. These places... You can do whatever you want to them. It's open, open season. But when it comes to China and other nuclear-armed nations, the rules are completely different. At least that's the way I understand it. I could be wrong. Just another similar follow-up, right? So you mentioned Vietnam, and we could also point to the recent withdrawal of U.S. troops in a disorderly fashion from Afghanistan and the Taliban, you know, seizing control of the country. Don't those two examples kind of challenge the assumption that Russia would get its ass handed to it by America? Because essentially we've seen the Taliban and the Viet Cong successfully contest against America. And obviously Russia's power is so much greater than those groups as to be almost in incomparable. So if the, if the Viet Cong, you know, essentially with withstood and eventually repulsed America and so did the Taliban, wouldn't that kind of suggest that Russia would absolutely crush them? Well, I mean, there's we gotta look at the details of the Vietnam War, and Afghanistan, and of course we need to look at Iraq as well because Iraq was one of those examples of swift and effective military action. We can look at Operation Desert War, where in the first 24 hours, basically the entire enemy military was subdued. Basically, they all just died and blew up and completely were destroyed. Planes flew with carbon filaments over the electricity lines, causing breakdowns of the electricity grid. Certain communication buildings were knocked out with missiles. There were stealth fighters flying in, circ in a circular pattern over Iraq in a continuous, you know, form. Oh, my. Give me one moment. Somebody is bothering me. Give me one sec. Take your time. Yeah, and if anyone has questions or comments, uh, feel free. This is sort of my area of interest, so I have quite a few. But anyone can ask anything at any time. Okay, I'm done. Let me uh, let me uh, talk about the thing real quick, though, the Vietnam and Afghanistan. There, there was actually a cool movie with Brad Pitt over it, uh, over the whole Afghanistan thing. And really, a lot of times, there was not enough forces allocated to deal with the problem that could have been dealt with. I think there is a greater chance of wanting to sustain a war than to win that war. I, I really believe, from a rational self-interest perspective, it is more beneficial to have a sustained war for, with, with countries that pose no real threat, like, like Afghanistan or whatever, because, one, you can use it as a training ground to improve your soldiers, test out new military toys, you can justify increased military budgets. You can always have an, a boogeyman, you know, to focus on whenever there is any kind of tension. So I do think like a perpetual war on terror, which was never really designed to win, I think, 
um, is is more beneficial than one that could have been won swiftly. I do believe that if the United States really wanted to win that war, it would have been similar to Desert Storm. I understand there's a huge difference between the two. One is guerrilla warfare, disorganized and spread. The other one is, you know, an organized military that was easily destroyed within a few days, really. Um, but even this guerrilla warfare, I, I do believe it is possible to completely wipe them out. And I don't think the think tanks in in the Pentagon and whatever ever had the intention of liberating the country from Taliban. We can tell from the outcome. What was the outcome? Most of the aid that went to Afghanistan, like 90% of it was for military weapons. And those ended up in the hands of the Taliban, making them stronger than ever before. The fact that America pulled out gives them this sort of... Um, boosts like this increased morale and people can rally around them as the victors that pushed out the evil invaders thereby making them even stronger and of course Taliban now completely controls the entirety of Afghanistan now we can think that the smartest minds and the smartest uh, think tanks and whatever strategists you know had a big blunder or you can think that this was kind of the, the, the MO, the modus operandi, and this was what was meant to be. And I think that's, that's more likely the case. As for, for Vietnam, I think there was a lot of political pressure to pull out, ideally. I think that was like one of the main reasons why it stopped. But when we look at the casualties and the damage, the United, and that was way back when the U.S. was far weaker, um, was like 50K soldiers dead. Whereas Vietnam, you know, there was like millions and of course chemical weapons, Agent Orange was used, more bombs were dropped in Vietnam than in World War II, and many other things. So it really, it's like, it, if the U.S. had wanted, they could have decimated Vietnam completely. I really believe um, it was more the internal pressure that, that caused the retreat more than anything else. This is yeah, all good discussion. Uh, I love this topic, so I could kind of go on with it indefinitely. Um, but does anyone else have a question or a comment? I guess I'll ask this. So given that America has depended on its uh, military hegemony, its military dominance for so long, how much longer do you think that's a viable model Uh given a few things. One, the fact that both Russia and China are closing or passing the gap. You know, China now has the biggest uh, navy in the world, bigger than the U.S. Uh, uh, Russia just created the Checkmate fighter, which is believed may actually be uh, equal or superior to the F-22, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also, the way in which the nature of war is changing in terms of the importance of cyber warfare and intelligence warfare, I know this is like an, a long and meandering question, but it's generally agreed that Russia is actually the best in the world at information warfare. And all the, you know, people say it's a conspiracy theory, the Russian influence, but actually I personally think it's quite clear that a lot of what you're saying in terms of the social breakdown of the United States is the result of successful social warfare, information warfare by Russia. So in other words, how much longer can this current model work before Russia, China, or both figure out a way around it? Right? Like, does America just keep investing in its military, or is that just running out? That is that era just coming out to an end in terms of how long they can rely on that? I I do think there is a kind of change in order. You're right. Russia does engage in an insane amount of information warfare, but let's not forget. So does the U.S. I mean, the CIA is involved in coups all across the world, manipulating, you know, supplanting whatever removing democracies and instilling dictatorships, you know, and all sorts of shenanigans, so to speak. So the U.S. is quite busy as well, you know, and their information agencies are in many ways larger with better technology. However, um, it is, I think, more likely that there will be more defensive measures taken against Russian uh, interference of any kind. I do think that, you know, as the world changes, so does the U.S., you know. It has to keep up with the growing and different threats. And I believe it is more than capable of, of adapting to the changing circumstances. 
I do think that there are huge problems with the way the military is run, and I think a kind of upgrade is necessary. I personally would want the military to be more mechanized, like fewer personnel, more advanced technology, and swarming drones. You know, I think drones are, are part of like the future. We have laser technology already. So my, my point is, things are changing, but then so is the U.S. And the U.S. being the most powerful nation with the most powerful information, with the best classified technology, with the greatest amount of political influence in the world, with the greatest amounts of economic influence in the world and economic pressure in the world and, and many, many, many other things, I think it is more likely than not that they will adapt successfully to counter any emerging threats. So you believe that... Um... You believe that America will be able to maintain hegemony or dominance for the foreseeable future? Or do you think that that age of American dominance will end and you will have a multipolar world? I, I don't see America stepping down anytime soon, at least not within my lifetime. I think if there's going to be any kind of global shift, one that maybe dethrone the U.S. would not be one where there is information warfare, psychological warfare, or anything of that nature. I think the, the, the thing that could potentially change it would be soft power and ideological warfare. I believe it is potentially possible to, I wouldn't say win, but to change the world and perhaps even unify different aspects of the world, creating alliances or, and shit like that. Um, things like NATO and more, you know, interrelated trade deals and blah, 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 such that the U.S. kind of becomes more similar to Britain, you know, where it was a world power, but it's still super, you know, big. The currency is still super powerful. It's still a big player, but it's not like the, the supreme commander of the world, whereas the United States in many ways is. If the U.S. decides to put sanctions on any country, that country is fucked because what it means is that if if people trade with that sanctioned country, then they're going to have to deal with U.S. not trading with them or U.S. putting pressures on their trading partners to not trade with them and blah, blah, blah. So I don't really see any any way of winning against the U.S. other than perhaps – you know, through persuasion and, and working together. I think that's really the only way you can deal with, with the U.S. Like, it's, it's something that – it's got so much momentum, I don't see it ever, ever truly stopping. Uh, wait, can, am, I, am I mic open? Yeah. Uh, so I haven't fully studied this article, and I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you, but I did think it was interesting. It's a Forbes article. I just posted in general chat. And it's talking about how actually, according to this analyst, sanctions against Russia essentially are not truly possible, at least not fully possible. Um, and it goes into a breakdown of how this kind of may not actually work out. So, I, I mean, just I'm not saying now, obviously, you don't have time to read it now, but maybe in the future, take a look at it and see what you think. Um, but basically, the one part of the argument that I saw was interesting is... Um, let me see if I can quickly find it. He basically said, money goes wherever money is treated well. Uh, yeah, it says right here. Um, money goes where it is treated well, and if it's seen as safe inside Russia, it will circulate there without regard to the wishes of the American political and foreign policy classes. So in other words, sanctions come from the president, but these people don't care about the president. They care about money, and all of these agents like Putin have had long periods of time to create elaborate financial backdoors. I mean, people have Swiss bank accounts that haven't paid any taxes, and those are just regular people. So imagine the kind of backdoors that Putin would have in place to bypass any financial sanctions. I'm not saying they wouldn't have any effect, but when you talk about your uh, country of birth and how badly decimated it was by sanctions, you know, I think you have to also keep in mind how different that country's, whatever it was, situation would have been from Russia's in terms of the backdoor avenues they have, especially when you consider that, you know, his ties to organized crime and the KGB and the intelligence apparatus and, you know, how hard would it be, in other words, for countries to continue to do business uh, in defiance of a sanction with Russia if it was profitable to do so? That's, that's, uh, that's a really good question. And the, the main point is 
if it is profitable to to deal with Russia. So one is if you're doing any sort of backdoor deals and knowing the United States intelligence agency and their ability to detect, that's a very big risk because what may seem profitable at that time, because you thought you could get away with it, may turn out to be very detrimental and not profitable. And uh, we can also look at you know the GDP of Russia and how it kind of went down after sanctions and how people are making far less money. And we know sanctions are effective. And even if you can find some back doors here and there that are like super secure, it will ha- well, it will still not be able to compensate for the great um, for the greater loss that that's happening. It might be able to ease it a little bit, cushion the blow a little bit, but it won't solve the problem entirely. And of course, the greater crackdown and the greater you know surveillance gets and information technology gets, the less likely you're able to hide between the cracks. And um, it, it's I just. I can see them doing that. Iran does that, for example, but that doesn't change the fact that the currency increased by 3,000%. You know, the, sorry, decreased by 3,000% or value last time I checked. Uh, even though they're doing all sorts of backdoor deals and, you know, gold, this and there, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and who knows? The, the, like, one of the potential outcomes is also that if the sanctions are too great, maybe the people will want to oust Putin. However, from my understanding is that when sanctions are put on people and people lose their college funds, the the ability to feed themselves effectively, the ability to get medicine, blah, 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 they're not going to be very friendly to the people that put those sanctions on them in the first place, which is why I think this is more escalation than de-escalation, which is why I'm not a really big fan of it, which is why I want to avoid the entire situation if possible. Um. I think it's worthwhile to continue this analysis because we may see this all play out in real time. So it'll be good to get on record and then we can compare what actually happens. But let's say that Russia invades Ukraine, America and its allies impose financial sanctions. Russia responds with counter sanctions, uh, in particular, Russia being a primary producer of uh, natural gas that's used uh, by the Europeans who would be asked to participate in these sanctions. Uh, So then Russia cuts off, you know, supplies of natural gas to them, and that affects their economy, their cost of shipping and production, and their bottom line, and then they start suffering too. And then China, right, this is the thing we haven't really talked about, is how closely Russia and China are allying. And, you know, Russia, Putin just got back from China from meeting with uh, Xi, Z, as expected, has his back. He's, you know, t- towing the line on everything, right? He's saying, you guys should should listen to Russia. You're ignoring their security concerns, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if China is willing to help Russia, how much does that mitigate financially being the number two economy, whatever sanctions that that America puts on? And couldn't that backfire by forcing Russia and China into a much tighter economic and political relationship? as a result of, you know, being even further cut off from the, you know, Western sphere of influence. And then where does that go? And, you know, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, sure. um, One thing is Hermes was right. When it comes to sanctions, there is a balance between uh, there's a dance that you want the sanctions to hurt, but if the sanctions hurt too much, it'll backfire in- entirely. Yep. And uh, the the question about the gas pipeline, I would say you could use business tactics against it. We can learn from the great Rockefeller. What did he do? You know, oh, he dropped down prices. So the other ones ran a business and he bought them all and blah, blah, blah. In this case, in a sense, if they're trying to withhold something, you can provide it for them, even if at a loss. You know, that's what Rockefeller did. He provided really cheap gas or sorry, really cheap oil at a loss. But eventually, you know, over time, the pressure was so much that the other side had to capitulate. So I think it is possible. And I know there are some great exporters of gas, natural gas in the Middle Middle East. I forgot which country it was, but I, I think it is possible to kind of give them the alternative gas that we provide through our allies or through ourselves, such that 
Russia wouldn't have that kind of leverage, so that would be one way of fucking them over. Um, and then the one with China, I don't think China is really ever going to do more than bark, because at the end of the day, they're really interdependent when it comes to the U.S., you know? So, like, it is a far greater loss for them to move to Russia than it is to stay with the U.S. Like, it makes more sense for them to continue being U.S.'s trading partner. So I just, I don't really see it working out in any way that's beneficial for Russia if they choose to go down this path. Great stuff. Uh, arguably, we could, uh, well, definitely, we could do a series of, of war-related podcasts. I'd like to do that. Military tactics, strategy, Sun Tzu, Musashi, China. So many things we could talk about. Uh, so many things we haven't talked about today, like you know, uh, artificial intelligence and how the automation of military systems changes the nature of war. But I'm wondering, should we... Do you, do you feel like we should continue, or should we, we put a cap on this soon? I do, I do want to stop. There was one question uh, Spectre asked. Uh, he asked in, v, in chat, I'm assuming he can't talk on mic for some reason. So his question was, why are governments brainwashing the population through the tap water and TV for profit? Do you think the vaccine is to maximize profits through the healthcare system? What are the next plans of the elites after the need for money ceases to exist? So first of all, I think that it is in the interest of the state to not brainwash its population, to have a highly educated population and have a healthy population. Because after all, the units of the state, the people, is what gives the power to the state. So that seems to be contradictory to their goals. And uh, do you think the vaccine is to maximize profits to the healthcare system? I would say any product is to maximize profits. So your Tylenol, you know, your whatever medicine you take that you don't, you know, freak out about, those are also for profit. Everything in this world, basically, in this capitalist world is for profit. And I understand that that can legitimately raise a certain degree of skepticism. However, it is important to realize that even though profit is the main goal, the, the efficacy of the drug must basically be a part of it to actually make it profitable. You know, Otherwise, why would people buy it? You know, there is the free market, so to speak. Um, and then what are the plans for the elite after the need for money ceases to exist? Well, uh, the elite is a little bit of a vague term, but I would say the need for greater power never ceases. Power is a, is a goal without an end. It's an infinite goal. The more you get, the more you want, and the more you can get. So I don't know if money is necessarily that goal or not, um, but I, I don't ever see an end to it. <clears throat> Great. So this has been uh, awesome. Thank you, everyone, for questions and participation. Um, Hermes, do you have a final takeaway thought to uh, leave people with? Yes. Peace is a lie. Anyone that tries to sell you peace is not your friend. Remember that the nature of this world is war, and the victor is dictated by that or who which has the most amount of power. And because we all share this reality, you getting it your way means another person potentially not getting it their way and vice versa, another person getting it their way could potentially mean you not getting it your way. So never give up. Always seek to improve yourself. One of the best ways to defeat your enemies is self-improvement. Seriously. Like if you have people that hate you, if you have enemies, all kinds of people, bullies, whatever, the best way to, to win over them, succeed in life. Get in a position of power. Be somebody important. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. Uh, we should do a series of events on various topics in the future, as we always have, Hermes. But uh, I'd also propose that we do a, an ongoing series about war and military, not necessarily just you and I, but uh, open discussions or whatever, because that is a big part of this server, right? My interest since I made the roundtable was 
more and more in the area of the military. And so this server, as well as a conspiracy theory and debate server, is going to be a, a place for tactics, strategy, security, defense, intelligence uh, discussion. So this was great to kind of kick that off. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, please join us on the Temple Mount Discord server. Keep an eye on the announcements channel, special events every single day. And keep an eye and make sure you follow and subscribe to the Temple Mount SoundCloud and Temple Mount YouTube at the top of the server. I think we're very close to 100 subscribers on our new channel. A lot more than that on the old channel. But please just go ahead and subscribe. Let's get to 100. It triggers my OCD when we're close to goals like that. So help me out. Thanks very much for me and everybody. God bless.